Hi, this is Jose Luis, and welcome to another hands-on exercise on this series, Introduction to Parametric Modeling, in which I'm going to model a <clears throat> I'm going to model the logic of a hanging piece of fabric. And I'm going to do that by having the two edges of this piece of fabric, and then I'm going to create a bunch of curves that have the catenary logic, so they sag more or less depending on the length and affected by the gravity of the, of, the, of the environment. And I'm going to model a loft surface among them, simulating more or less the physical, um, the physical effect that gravity would have on a piece of flexible fabric that would be hanging. And I'm also going to show you a little bit how we can modify the gravity so that instead of uh, pointing down, it can point up and maybe this object, instead of being now a piece of hanging fabric, can be perhaps a, an architectural canopy or some kind of, um, I don't know, some kind of built form in 3D. I don't know. So this exercise is going to be super simple. We're going to learn a little bit of more geometry, more curves, but um, it's going to be like a super, super simple exercise. Let's take a look at how to do that very briefly. Wonderful, let's get started. As usual, we're going to do some sketching and some drawing to think through the process and then try to figure out the steps that we're going to follow to generate the geometry of this hanging cloth. As we said before, the hanging cloth is going to look something like this. It's going to be uh, a piece of fabric that is somehow going to be draping, elastically or not, uh, from two boundary conditions that are going to be the edges. So <clears throat> I think for me, in this exercise, it's going to be important to start with some kind of input parameter that is going to be the edges of that piece of fabric. So the shape of the two boundaries that are going to be holding this geometry, holding this piece of fabric together. And um, the way we can approach this problem is that what we want to do is we want to generate, we want to end up with some kind of surface here, right? Uh, we want to end up with some kind of surface here that <clears throat> kind of follows the logic of some kind of draping mechanism or like the physics of a fabric just being affected by gravity. So if that's the case, what I can do is, for example, I can generate a surface that is going through a lot of curves. So I can generate a loft surface that is going through a bunch of curves that are joining these two edge curves. And the shape of each one of those curves, in order to make it perhaps a bit more physically accurate, I can actually use what's called catenary curves. And catenary curves are curves that have a, the shape that is very close or uh, that is physically accurate to the shape that a chain or any piece of thread or any basically any linearly elastic element would have if if um, if under the weight if only sorry if under its own self weight affected by gravity so if i take a chain or a piece of rope and i hold the two extremes the shape that it deforms under with no additional weight just its own self weight under gravity that shape is typically called a catenary shape and there are mathematical um, there are mathematical models that describe that shape very accurately. So what I could do is I could say, for example, the process that I'm going to follow is I'm going to start with my two input curves. Something that I could do is I can subdivide each one of those curves into a control amount of points. So how many points may also be a parameter in my definition. And the more points I have, the more define the surface is going to be, but also the heavier. So there's always got to be like some kind of balance there. And then once I have that, I can probably draw catenary curves between the edges of between the points in each one of the two sides of the curves, each one of them having a particular length are affected by particular gravity, which could also be, which could also be part of the one of my parameters, the length of each one of those chains and how strong the gravity is pulling up or is pulling down. And then last but not least, when I have, once I have those curves, what I can do is I can just trace a surface that lofts through all those curves and generates this 
napkin sort of hanging fabric kind of uh, situation. It may not be physically accurate, but it's going to be very close to the actual shape that a, this, that a fabric under these forces will have. So with that, I think we're probably ready to start um, taking a look at how to implement this using Grasshopper, for example. Let's start by the basics. As we said, uh, our input parameters are going to be two curves that I'm going to um, that I'm going to that I'm going to have in Rhino and that I'm going to bring into Grasshopper. So I'm going to draw one curve here. So that's going to be one of the edges, for example. And the other one is going to look something like this, for example, so that the shape is not exactly the same. And we have a little bit of variability. And actually, you know what? I'm going to move this a little closer here. Uh, I don't know. We can we can probably play with that later on. And then I'm going to bring the two curves here into Grasshopper. So I'm going to look for a curve, empty parameter, or I can just do that here under geometry curve. I can drop this here, right click and set one curve. That's going to be the left one. And then I'm going to drop another one and set the other curve, the second one here. If I drop some panels here, you can see that I have the curve here. It's a planar curve, it's another planar curve. They don't need to be planar. We can change that later. All right. Okay. Well, then another parameter. So that what we said before is that now what I need to do is I need to subdivide each one of those curves into a bunch of points. So I can do that by going back to, we have seen this component before, I can go to curves, division, divide curve, and then I can drop that here. And then I can plug this one, and then I can drop another one, we're going to do two separate ones, and then I can drop the other curve into the other one. And of course, right now it's dividing into 10 segments just because it's the default. Uh, but if I actually want to control that, I can just double click and drop a slider here. And a shortcut to using sliders is actually that if I just type a number, so for example, 20, it will create a number slider going from 0 to 20. So uh, actually going from 0 to the largest multiple of 10 uh, for that number. So anyway, so I can place 20 and 20 here, and then I can now play with how many curves are going to show up here. All right. Okie dokie. So, so that's great. And then the next thing that we need to do is that we need to, mo we need to join these two families of points with curves that follow a catenary logic. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm offering these suggestions because I know it's part of what Grasshopper can give you. But if you had other ideas, we can totally do other, other types of curves. So for example, uh, I can go to, if I go to spline, to curves spline, you can see that all the way down here, there is a catenary chain between two points component. If I do that, I can place it here. And let's take a look at the inputs. This is a really good thing again uh, to do as practice. So A is going to be the start point, B is going to be the end point, L is going to be the length of the catenary chain. So that has to be longer than the distance between the two points. And G is going to be the direction of gravity. And you can see that the hex icon is an arrow, which if I go here and I take a look at what arrows are, it means that an arrow is a vector. We haven't really seen vectors yet. We will see them very soon down the list. But long story short, an, uh, uh, a vector is basically a direction in three-dimensional space, kind of. So we will be able to work with that. So let's start simple. So if let's start, let's point, let's add here the starting points of the catenary. So that's the first family of points. And let's add to this, the second family to the input B. And you're going to see that something weird is going to happen, which is that, well, first of all, <laughs> we don't get any curves because we are not feeding in the length component. So let me create here a component, a slider. So I'm going to type just 100 as a number, and you see that I get a slider right away from 0 to 100. So I'm going to place 100 here as the length, okay? And you can see that immediately I get all these catenary curves. And if I reduce this, you can see that, as I said before, something weird is happening. So if I look from the top, you can see that the, the curves are crossing, okay? which is probably not what I wanted. I wanted something more in the lines of uh, from one end, from the start end, from, 
from the same start end to the same end end. That was a terrible way of saying it. Um, this is because I, I did it on purpose. When I drew this curve, I drew this curve starting from here, then throwing interpolation points here and ending here. Whereas when I drew the second one, I started with the end start point here and I started drawing this way and I ended here. Therefore, what happens is that the internal direction of where the curve starts and where the curve ends are actually in opposite directions. So the first point of the division is this one for this curve, but the first point of the division is this one for this curve because this is the start point and this is the start point. So because the start points are in opposite directions, this is why I get this effect. This is very simple to solve. I could, by just simply flipping the internal orientation of one of the curves. I can do that by modifying the curve directly in Rhino. So I can just click that curve and type here, flip, right? And then as I do, the internal orientation is flipped. So the start and the end points um, flip. And then now I get an order list of a much nicer, a much nicer uh, distribution of the curves. If for some reason I couldn't do this in Rhino and I wanted to do it in Grasshopper, that's also a possibility. So I can just go here to curve to utilities and to flip curve. And what I can do is I can just flip one of the curves and then that flip curve, I can just feed it into uh, the other component. Okay. So uh, that could be one way to go about this. And I'm just going to expand this here. And I'm going to as I'm going to shorten this span here. And I want you to notice how because all the all the chains have the same length, the ones that are joining points that are closer to each other are have a longer sack, whereas the ones that are joining points that are farther away have a shorter sack here, which is kind of which kind of makes sense for a for a fabric that would have the same distance between the two ends of the curve, right? So I think this is a really interesting example. And, um, and then once I have my family of curves here, so you can see that the output of the catenary is a bunch of curves, right? So what I can do is I can now say, well, let's loft a surface across all of these curves. So I'm just going to go to surface, I'm going to go to freeform and in freeform, I can find loft. If I drop this here and I don't care much about the options, okay, then what I can see is that the result is this surface that is giving me, um, that is, that is going through all this, all these curves. And if I disable the curves and the points, I can see that I have a very clean kind of surface that has that feeling of um, that has that feeling of that feeling of a hanging cloth. The last thing that I would like to do is we haven't really seen vectors yet. But if you remember, the catenary had the direction of gravity, which right now, if you look at the component at the at the input says zero, zero minus one, which means that it's gravity is a vector that is going in the negative z direction. So it's for is pointing down. But actually, we can change that. So we will see this very soon. But I can create, for example, a vector out of x, y, z components. All right. And then for the x, I can keep zero for the y, I can keep zero. But for z, I can just add a number slider that is going to that is going to go from, for example, from minus 10 to positive 10. Okay, and I'm going to plug this here. And remember that this was at minus one. And actually, let me rewrite this so that it's from minus one to positive one, just so that it's not, it's not too crazy. So we have here now a vector that is zero, zero minus one. So if I plug this here into gravity, we have the exact same thing that we had before. But now if I modify this vector and I instead of making it minus one, I start increasing it positively and I move it all the way to positive one, you can see that now 
the direction of the vector has shifted and is pointing up, which means that we're doing some kind of like anti-gravity sort of situation. And therefore, in this case, I have this surface that could be perhaps, um, I don't know, the, a pavilion. Um, and if we made this pavilion with stone, because stone is also a material that is really good at, um, at like self weight. So this form could actually be pretty good structurally for such a pavilion. Uh, there's many other things that we need to take care of, but uh, it could be a good prototype, a good uh, proof of concept. Um, this is very similar to the process that actually Antonio Gaudí, the, uh, the, uh, the Spanish architect, used to follow for designing his structure like the Sagrada Familia and uh, many of his like really interesting architecture from the beginning of the 20th century. So, so yeah, so this was a really simple model on how to create um, a surface that has some physical draping kind of catenary logic. Um, do I want to say anything else about this? I don't think so. Um, so that was great. Um, and now if you like this video, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, all those things. And then I think we're going to do one more ex hands-on exercise in the series, Introduction to Parametric Modeling, before we go back to um, learning more concepts, okay? Thank you very much. See you in the next video.